You know, one of the things that we try to do is not just uh, teach you bits and pieces of a puzzle, but we try to give you the, the skills and the strategies and understanding to actually begin to put that puzzle together yourself. Because this isn't our journey for you, it's your journey, and we're meant to provide you with the tools you need to take that journey on your own. And so we're going to do a little bit of that this month. You know, the last two months, we've talked a lot about this idea of a story that reclaims us. And you know, our scripture verse for our church, our primary one, there's a couple, but our primary one is John chapter 10, verse 10, and it goes like this. It says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come, this is Jesus talking, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I have come that they may have. He's, he's reclaiming something in us. I have come, they don't have something, I have come so that they may have. And that thing is life. Jesus is reclaiming us into this broader story of God's redemption for humanity. We, we, we continually walk away, that song says, I confess I was a prodigal. Like, I confess, I, you know, you, you had a plan for me and I made my own roads. I confess the shackles I wear, I bought on my own. All these ideas that God's goodness has never wavered. It's us that have continually, most Tuesdays are Fridays. We, we come to church and we get excited and then Sunday afternoon we slip away again. But God's truth is, and, he, and Jesus is talking about shepherds, and he's talking about sheep and paddocks, and, he's, and the Old Testament speaks a lot of that. A lot of the, the Pharisees were not good shepherds of God's people. And, and Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. He says, I've come that they may have this life. And what we'll find as we read Scripture, as we, as we dive in, not just for a moment, not just for 15 minutes, not just for one Scripture or a memorization plan, but as we meditate on Scripture. It's kind of one of the big themes I want to get across to you this month. That reading scripture is just the beginning of the journey towards the goal. Meditating on scripture. That's why we sing these songs that are based in scripture. Because you, it's hard to memorize things. It's easy to remember songs. You want to get these scriptural ideas in your head so that you're constantly thinking about them. Because as you read scripture that way, scripture will begin to read you. As you begin to read scripture in that way, scripture will be able to come alive in your life in a way you never thought possible. And your little story of your life will find incredible significance in the unveiling of the larger story of what God wants to do in your world. So for this month, we're talking about the book of Ruth. And, and I read the book of Ruth several times. It's only four chapters, so it's super uh, satisfying because you can read it in like no time at all. And you're like, oh, I've read a book of the Bible today. I'm good. Check. 9.30 in the morning. Great. Read it again. Lunchtime. Check. I read two books of the Bible. Same book. Two books. Already today, and I've only, I've only gotten to lunchtime. It's so easy. It's fantastic. But sometimes what happens is, and this happens to me, I believe it happens to you. I think it happens to all of us. We read scripture and we think we know what's happening, but really there's a deeper truth. It's one of the reasons why we meditate on scripture. I, we, we think we understand how to read this book. We think we understand what God's trying to tell us, but we're missing the whole point. And so one of the tools we give you every week, and before we get into this, Ruth, book, this Ruth scripture, we're going to take the whole first half of this message just to talk about how to look at this. And again, I, I don't pretend that you have all the skill sets. I don't pretend like you've been to college and taken all the classes and understand how to do all this. But the beauty is we live in 2023 and we are blessed. Yeah. Other people have done this for us. They've recorded it, stuck it on YouTube, and it's easy to find. Now, you've got to find the right things because some of the wrong things are pretty wrong. But we support every month this thing called the Bible Project. The Bible Project is fantastic. It's, there's more content there than you could consume this year. My wife is doing the one-year Bible plan with the Bible Project, and she's finding incredible, incredible new insights in what's going on. I don't know how you use it regularly, but all I ask is that you do, because it's a fantastic resource. And today, we're going to watch a Bible Project video called An Introduction to Biblical Narrative, and they're focusing on plot. And it's going to help us, I'll show you as soon as the video is over, how it's going to help us see what we may be missing in the book of Ruth. So do me a favor, get ready, let's watch this video together. We're learning how to read different types of literature in the Bible. And we're going to start by talking about biblical narrative. So narratives, in their most basic form, have characters in a setting going through a series of events. 
And how those events are selected and then arranged by an author, that's called the plot. A basic plot line begins with a character in her setting. But then something new or unexpected happens, causing problems that lead up to some ultimate conflict, which is then resolved and the character finds herself changed, living in a new normal. Now, in reading narratives, it's important to understand every scene in the context of its larger plot line. You can make the same story have a totally different message if you ignore where it occurs in the plot. This happens all the time when people read the Bible. Really? Yeah, take, for example, the story about Gideon. There's this well-known scene where Gideon's trying to discern whether God will help him win a battle, and he requests a sign from God. Yeah, Gideon lays a wool fleece on the ground and asks that in the morning the fleece be wet with dew, but the ground totally dry, and God does it. Now, if you look at this scene just by itself, what is the conflict? How can Gideon know if he'll succeed? And the resolution? Test God, ask for a sign, and find out. Yeah, and that's how many people actually read this story, and it totally misses the point because it's ignoring the larger plot line. Really? Yeah, so let's start from the beginning. You'll get the context. The story begins with Gideon and the Israelites living in fear because they're oppressed by an invading people, the Midianites. Got it. Then there's the call to action. God commissions Gideon to defeat the Midianites and save Israel. Yeah, this is shaping up to be a good story. But then Gideon's super hesitant, so he asks God to do this magic trick, a sign, so I can know it's really you talking to me. And God stoops to his level. He gives him a sign by lighting the fire on an altar. So Gideon's already asked for a sign. And that's not all. In the next scene, God tells Gideon to tear down an altar to another god, but Gideon's so afraid, he does it at night. So Gideon's skeptical and also a bit of a coward. Then we come to the moment where Gideon's about to face the Midianites, and he's still uncertain, so he asks for another sign, the fleece. He says, I want to know if you'll save Israel by my hand. And God gives him that sign. And he's still uncertain, so he asks for even one more sign, which is just a variation of the previous sign. Okay, so Gideon's asking for way too many signs. Exactly. In the larger context, it's clear the plot conflict is not how can Gideon discern the mysterious will of God. The real conflict is, when will this guy get his act together and start trusting God? Okay, so then what's the resolution? We have to keep reading. So Gideon gathers this huge army, 30,000 soldiers to fight the Midianites, and God says, no, way too many men. He whittles the army down to 300. Why would he do that? Well, Gideon's been testing God, so now God returns the favor. He tells Gideon to arm these 300 soldiers with trumpets and torches, and then surround the Midianites at night and make all this noise in the hills, which sounds ridiculous, but Gideon does it. And the noise scares the Midianites into this frenzy. They start destroying each other in the dark while Gideon looks on safely from the hills. So this story isn't offering the reader tips for discerning God's will. No, it's about God's commitment to use weak people with deep flaws to do more than they could have imagined. Okay, so short scenes like Gideon and the Fleece are combined with other scenes making up a larger plot line. And tracing the conflict and resolution through the plot helps you see the message the author's trying to get across. Now, Gideon's story has been set alongside many other stories that are also about these flawed, often questionable leaders called judges. And each of these has its own internal plot line. But then altogether, they make up a whole movement of the biblical story, the period of the judges, and that has its own unified plot line. And there are many movements within the story of the Bible. Exactly. And all the smaller stories, hundreds of them, they fit within the context of their own movements. And then these movements together make up the building blocks of the grand plot line of the whole story of the Bible. So no matter where I'm reading in the Bible, I need to pay attention to these different layers of plot so I can read each story in context. Exactly. The Bible is such a sophisticated piece of literature. And so all these smaller plot lines keep overlapping, building up the tension. And when you back up, you can see how they've all been woven together into the unified story that leads to Jesus. Okay, so let's take that video and let's apply it to our context. Okay, so we're reading the book of Ruth and we're going, okay, I've read the book of Ruth before. Many of you have, many of you haven't. The book of Ruth, if you read it just straight up, you go, oh, this is a story about a, a girl and her mother-in-law who are having a really difficult time and, and God blesses them and ends up, they end up being pretty good. Wow, cool, God is, God is good. 
Like, you can read the story a hundred times and take that away every time and go, wow, this story is just telling me that God is good. And man, that's so encouraging. I think I'll read the book of Ruth again. Fantastic. But that's not. <laughs> that, that may be on some level, like the, the smallest bit. But there's so much more here. So do me a favor and, and give me some patience today because I'm going to go really slow through a couple of things to show you there's a deeper reality right here. Let's start, let's start at the very beginning because it took me 30 minutes to get past the beginning. It took me 30 minutes to get past Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Let's read it together. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 says this. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, so a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now, I've read that scripture tons of times. I've never stopped. But after watching the Bible Project video, I went, In the days when the judges ruled. Why is the author of Ruth telling us that? They don't tell us the color of Ruth's hair. They don't tell us how old Ruth was. They don't give us her, her, her personality profile or Enneagram number. They don't give us any of that. But he, he does tell us, in the days when the judges ruled. So you know what I did? I went back immediately and watched the Bible Project video on judges. So I could understand a little bit better about the context of this story. And this is what's happening. This is where the book of Ruth is placed in Scripture, and you got to think, you know, they're putting the, the canon of Scripture together, which I don't have the whole idea of how they did that exactly, but, but you know, the, the, the canon, the, the context of Scripture was a bunch of scrolls, like Jackson might have, you know, Corinthians, and, and Jenny might have Romans, and not everyone had everything, and it took hundreds of years after the New Testament was written for them to come together and put all these things together, and the, 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 the canon of Scripture was assembled in the Old Testament in a very similar way. And they, they had to get, you know, they had to get somebody to figure out where the book of Ruth went. And the book of Ruth is right in this spot, right after the book of Judges. So what happens in the book of Judges? Well, the book of Judges takes place, this whole time period where Ruth is, takes place right after the book of Joshua. And the Israelites come into the land, they take the land, Joshua says, hey, serve the Lord your whole life, you're in the promised land, let's go. The book of Judges starts out, and they find, we find out that they've taken some of the land, but not all of the land. And instead of the Israelites thriving without Joshua and finishing the job, they actually start to shrink back and worship Canaanite gods. And they get in lots of trouble, and they don't have a leader to, to lead them, and they get really confused, and things start to go really wrong. These Israelites who, who, who were taken out of the desert and into the promised land. These Israelites who were taken out of slavery and into God's presence. These Israelites went through the desert in God's presence and found the promised land. These same Israelites are now falling back away from God again. God has taken them all this way, but they're beginning to fall back. And what happens in the book of Judges is all these people, we'll talk about this next month, all of these judges, these, they're not like judges like with a gavel and a black robe. They're judges like great warriors who are fighting for Israel. And these judges, we'll find out next month, are crazy flawed. They have all these issues. They're not righteous men. They've got a lot, like Gideon. He, he, Gideon ends up, the story of Gideon is really dark at the end. He, he makes really bad decisions. And in the middle of all this leaderless, all this conflict, all this falling away from God, we find the book of Ruth. Let me show you a hint of the larger plot line. Let's look at the last line in the book of Judges. The last line in the book of Judges says this. Judges 21, 25, it says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. All right? The last lines of the book of, Judge, of Ruth say this. Ruth 14, 16 to 17 says, Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. At the end of Judges, it says, the Israelites had no king, so they did whatever they want. At the end of the next book, at the end of the book of Ruth, it says, hey, a king is coming. Right. Hey, David's right on the edge. And if we can read the book of Ruth for forever and just go, oh, it's kind of nice that he's guy, like she's in the lineage of Jesus. How cool is that? No, no, it's way cooler because Israel is in darkness. Israel is lacking all hope. Israel doesn't know what to do. We end the book of Judges, they're going, there's no king, and so we can't figure out what's happening. And then the book of Ruth comes along and says, during that same season, God was already moving. 
During that same season, they wrote this whole book and you never saw it. But during this same season, there was another story behind the scenes that no one knew about. And the God who was faithful in Israel, the God who is faithful in the desert, the God who is faithful in Egypt is faithful again. And he's already begun to deliver his people. And that's just Ruth chapter 1, verse 1a. It's not even the whole verse. I had to watch seven minutes of video and read 20 pages of commentary to give you that three minutes of awesomeness that shows you, just like it's set up there, that this story, gave, all the Marvel fans were stoked because they had these comics. Go, <laughs> all of these beautiful scenes that lead to Jesus include this story. There's so much more happening beyond What's simply written on the page, we've got to pay attention to what's going on. It gives us a brand new perspective on the story when we understand that this little story is part of a much bigger story. It'll give you a brand new perspective on your life when you recognize that this is a story that reclaims us too. That your little story is part of a much bigger story even though you may not now recognize it, it's true. Because the God who was faithful to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who was faithful to Moses and Joshua and Gideon and Deborah and Ruth, that same God is faithful to you today. And we're not going to see, you're going to read Ruth with me, I hope, so several times over this next 30 days, you're not going to see the name of God mentioned many times in this book. But he's moving in every verse. You may not see God moving in your life today. You may not see God moving in your life this month. It may be a long time from your perspective that you've seen God move in your world. But this is the thing. That's your perspective. It doesn't mean it's the truth. And the truth is evident right here. The truth is screaming in our face. What the writer of Ruth is trying to tell us is that even when times were dark and so many couldn't see the hand of God moving, he was moving behind the scenes where we, me and you, we have the privilege of hindsight. We can see what God was doing so that it informs our story to that God is also moving in our world. And we know it wasn't just that Boaz was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David, we know that David was eventually the father of Jesus. We have a whole nother redemption perspective that the writer Ruth didn't even have. Now he knew, he knew that David was the linchpin for the Messiah, but we see thousands of years later, we see the beauty that God was faithful even after this story came to fruition. So I want to take you through this story this month with this perspective in mind so that, two things, number one, you can see that the scriptures that you have in your hand, that you have probably in every room in your house, are much more vast, much more relevant, much more informative for your world than you could ever imagine they are. That's number one. And number two, so that you can have an example, real time of a book you may have read a hundred times, maybe you've never read it before, but you'll recognize that with a new perspective, with a new paradigm that says God is faithful, he is good, and he wants to say something to me and us and the world. He wants to reclaim my story just like he reclaimed this story. This book isn't about you, but it absolutely is for you. So you can know that the God who is faithful to these, this family will be faithful to yours as well. Let's look. So we've gotten through the context. We see what's happening with Ruth. We understand the judge's relationship. We understand the redemptive status that it's not just about Ruth and Naomi and all those people. It's about us too. Let's look at these scriptures in the book of Ruth and see what he's saying in Ruth chapter 1. Here's Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 again. Let's read it again, then we'll keep going. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, okay? So it's a pretty big deal. There's a famine in the land. This is an agricultural society. People literally can't eat. 
People literally are starving. This isn't like, oh, there's, you know, there's a run on toilet paper because of COVID. This isn't like modern first world problems. This is like there is no food. There is nothing. Your children are starving. Your, your, your family is starving to death. There's a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Okay, here we go. Another big thing we need to recognize. Why is he telling us this? Because Israelites weren't supposed to leave the promised land. They're supposed to have faith in the God that they serve. Like the whole country's going crazy. Now there's a famine. They're not supposed to run away to the country of Moab, their enemies. They're supposed to turn and repent. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I will come and heal their land. That's the principle. Not when the going get tough, the tough get going. Let's go to Moab. Yet this family goes off to Moab. Verses three through five says this. It says, now Elimelech, that man, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women. Red flag. Israelites aren't supposed to marry Moabite women. So here they are. They're, they've gone to a foreign land because they don't have enough faith that God's going to redeem them. Now they're intermarrying with the locals. They're getting their local house gods. All these things. They're getting farther and farther away from God. Red flag, red flag. We're not even in verse 4 yet. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years. Here's another good one. We go, oh, this all happened like in a day and a half. This was was a weekend in the life of Ruth. No, no. They're in this land. They are suffering for 10 years. Ruth doesn't have a child. There's no birth control in the Old Testament. Ruth and her husband, they they will not survive in old age if they do not have children to help take care of them. It's been 10 years and she's childless. It's been 10 years and Naomi doesn't have grandsons. Now she's got three women in an era where women had no rights and no privilege. She's in a foreign land and she feels forgotten. Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. All right, so Naomi's in a bad way. It's 10 years on. Now the sons die. She's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is, this is crazy. And we see in the book of Ruth, we see her struggling with this idea. And we'll see that in just a second. But now let's look at verse 6. The next verse, it says, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people, that was what she was supposed to be waiting for. When when she heard that the Lord had come to the aid of her people by providing food for them, she and her daughter-in-law prepared to return home from there. So immediately we see, behind the scenes, God is reclaiming her story because she and her family left. They did the wrong thing for a long time. But she heard about God's faithfulness. She hadn't been in church for years, but one of her friends heard about one of her friends having God do something great in her life. She hadn't eaten in forever, but she heard somewhere that God had delivered another. And so she got curious, and she decided to inquire again. She decided, like Pastor Matt said today, to take up that prayer again because she heard on the testimony video for Connect. She said, I'm not going to be a part of a community. I'm just going to come and watch, and I'm going to walk out right after it's over. I've been a part of church, and those people are messed up. That's the truth. (laughs) There's no question we're messed up. Like, that's what we're here. That's what this is all about. We're all messed up, and God is coming to redeem us. We've all got issues, but God has grace to cover us. We often fail to have grace for one another, but we're working on that. That's why we get together. So that when we don't have grace, Crystal can remind us, Don can remind us, David can remind us that we need to have grace for one another. Because when we find the perfect church, they won't let us join because we'll be the only imperfect ones there. Like, we're, the only thing that holds us together is that we know that we're all sinners. The only thing that holds us together is to know we all can't do it, but we're saved by grace. And that God has a hope for us that God help us, literally, we can't see for ourselves. But we're hearing stories. They couldn't have a baby last year, and they had a baby. They couldn't find a job, and now they have a job they never even knew was, like, existed in the world. 
their daughter hasn't spoken to them in 15 years, and she just came to church with them last week. You know, the, the doctor gave them a diagnosis. There was an x-ray, and it's gone. They're hearing testimonies about the goodness of God, and they're curious. So they come back and back and back and back. But let's be honest, Ruth is in a bad way. I mean, sorry, Naomi's in a bad way. You can't look at her and go, oh, well, she's just dead in that faith. No, no, you've had those moments. You've had those dark times. Like, everyone knows, you don't know many scripture passages, but everybody knows, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because we all walk through the valley of the shadow of death sometimes. We, we know that scripture because it seems so real in our life. It resonates with our souls. And Naomi says this in Ruth 20, 21. She goes back, all of her friends are like, oh, oh my gosh, she's back in Bethlehem. They're like, oh my gosh, it's Naomi. Can you believe it? She left her Moab and she's back. We can't believe it. That's Naomi. And she says, Naomi means like blessed or, or, or beautiful. And she says, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, which means like miserable. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Now, did he make her life bitter? Or did she run away from God in that last moment? Is God providing food for her in the land? Is God already providing provision as we read the book that's bringing her back into her best life? Or isn't he? But her perspective is, don't call me blessed, call me Mara, because my, the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back again empty. I went away full, God has brought me back again empty. This is the funny thing, as you read this story this month, just know this, Ruth is right here. She went to Moab, and she, her husband dies, her, her, her kids die, God's providing. She walks back, all her friends are like, you're back, you're back, you're back. And they're like, I, I've got nothing. I've got no one. I, I'm coming back empty. Ruth is right there. She brought Ruth back, but she doesn't consider Ruth a blessing. But wait to see what happens with Ruth in her world. This is Ruth who in verse one, sorry, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, when, when Naomi says, go away, don't go with me because I'm cursed, Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. This is a girl who had the opportunity to start a new life without her anchor of a mother-in-law who's just depressed and miserable and she's steeped in it. She can't, she's like, don't even, I'm changing my name to bitter. I'm changing my name to sadness. Like if Maggie came to church the next week and she's like, hey, don't call me Maggie anymore. Just call me sadness. That's my new name. That's my truth. Just call me sadness. And Ben said, where you go, I will go. Don't, don't tell me where you go, I will go. He stays and he stays. She stays with, she has a better opportunity without her, but she stays with her. Then she gets home and her, everyone's like, oh, Naomi's back, fantastic. And she's like, oh, I'm empty, I have nothing. Except for this incredible, young, faithful, energetic, hopeful woman. I have nothing. God's providing food for her. Now he's providing a family for her, but she just can't see it. I could sit here and tell you what a terrible person Naomi is, but you know what she is? She's a person. She's a human being. Now, when you read the story, you don't think she's that sad, but it's been 10, five and five, two hands, 10 years. You'd be that sad too. She thinks God has totally forgotten her. And you go, that's not true. We're in church. We just sang that great song about homecoming. He hasn't forgotten you. Yeah, yeah, when you sing the song, that's one thing. When your life takes a turn, it's a whole different thing. She's just living like you and I live. This story is informing our story. Go back to Ruth, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. She brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, she says. The Lord has afflicted me. No, he hasn't. The Lord Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. No, he hasn't. The Lord is redeeming you. The Lord is reclaiming you. Like Pastor Matt said, she was praying for prosperity where she was planted, but God had a better plan for her life. She just couldn't see it. God's causing her grief to bring her back into his, to reclaim her story, but she just can't see it. But just wait a minute, because despite her self-pity, God 
is coming. As we read chapter 1, this is what we find at the end. Ruth 1, verse 22. It says, So Naomi turned from, returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was just beginning. As the fruit was just beginning. As the harvest was just beginning. What is the author trying to tell us? God brought her back at just this point. I can't read the whole story to you. Watch the Bible Project video this week. Read the story. Hold there in chapter 1 for a while. What you will see in chapter 2, we'll talk about this a lot next week. What you will see is that they just happen to come back when the barley harvest starts. Naomi's just miserable. She's like, oh, my truth is so bad. I'm so miserable. Oh, I have no chance. God's neglected me. And Ruth goes, hey, do you mind if I go out and get us some food? (laughs) And she's like, sure, yeah, whatever, go, 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 which is a dangerous thing for her to do. Women would be raped. They would be beaten. They would be killed alone in these fields. But Ruth just happens to find the field, just happens at the beginning of the harvest, just happens to find the field of Boaz, who just happens to be one of Naomi's relatives, who just happens to be one of her closest relatives, a kinsman redeemer who can bring her whole family back into the story, who can reclaim the whole family back into abundance, she just happens to be there, and she just happens to be harvesting in Boaz's field. Boaz just happens to come on that day, and Boaz just happens to notice her, and he happens to say, hey, I've heard about her and her faithfulness to my relative Naomi, Give her favor. It's just, it's just coincidence, really. It's just dumb luck. Like, it couldn't be that God is moving. It couldn't be that the writer of Ruth is telling us all of these things because in Ruth's mind, it's all coincidence. But in reality, she just so happens to find this woman, Ruth, who happens to walk with her back into her home. Ruth the Moabite she had no inheritance. She had no, she had no destiny in God. She wasn't an Israelite. Jesus hadn't come. He hadn't reclaimed everyone yet. Israel was supposed to be the, Israel was supposed to be the light to all nations, but they're, they're, they're shirking the responsibility, so she's got nothing. But she comes going, God, deal with me ever so severely if I don't stay with you. And she picks herself up. She goes out. She happens to be at the harvest. She happens to be at the right field On the right day, the right man noticed her. The right man has already heard about her. The right man says, bless her. Don't let her leave. She leaves the first day with a week's worth of food and leftovers from lunch. She's so blessed. She's so abundant. Even Naomi can't believe it. And so God begins this incredible story of redemption that even when Naomi can't see and she can't confess, God is already doing incredible things in her life. What is that telling us today? I told you, I want to leave you with tools to dive into this word. And I also want to leave you with an understanding that your story, maybe you're here today and you're in a fantastic place. Great. Write those things down and put them in a drawer because your life will take a turn. I'm not, this is just how the world works. If you're the happiest person alive and you're never sad, that means you've got a problem. (laughs) Like, some kind of reality is missing from your world because the world is a broken place and broken things happen to every person. So if your world is going great, man, thank God. Thank God. Enter in his courts with thanksgiving, enter in his gates with praise. Man, take that flag and just sing his songs all day long. That's fantastic. If you're not in that place, go back to your drawer. Pull out the paper from when you're on the mountaintop and start remembering his goodness. Instead of Naomi going, oh, there's, everything's bad. There's no goodness. God has forgotten me. God has afflicted me. That's not how it works. If we'll remember the larger story, the biggest problem, if you watch the Bible Project video in the book of Judges, the biggest problem is that Israel forgot the character of God. How do we avoid making that same mistake? We get into his word, and we build a testimony. Revelation says, the enemy is defeated by the blood of the lamb. He already did that. And what's the other thing? The word of your testimony. So get that testimony going. Start writing down the story of what God has done in your world. 
Because when the times get tough, it's good to know that the God who delivered you from the lion and the bear will also take down this Goliath that's coming into your life. And maybe the lion and the bear seemed like a big deal 10 years ago, but you can take those guys now. It's time to grab the Goliath. Set your stake right there because it's just the beginning. This deliverance that's about to happen, it's not just for Naomi. This deliverance that God's about to let you read about, it's not just for Ruth. This, this book isn't just about Boaz, although we'll talk about him. It's a great analogy for Jesus. But it's not just about Naomi. It's not just about Ruth. It's not just about Boaz. The truth is, this story is meant to inform your story. Because your story is a tile in the mosaic of God's redemptive purpose for all of history. And just like this story, if you read it right, don't don't pull the Gideon move and miss the whole message. If you read it right, this story will inspire hope in you. And your friend at work, they won't read Ruth. And your friend on the baseball team, they're not reading in their Bible every day. And and, and your your friends that work with you at the hospital, they're they're not going to church on Sunday. They're just taking the day off. They just need a mental health day. Fair enough. It's a tough job but they're missing. They're missing what God is giving you today. And your mission is to carry that hope, to carry that joy, to carry that reality with you. So when people don't have their own testimony, you can give them a taste of yours. And they will say one day, I felt neglected, I felt bitter, I felt Like God didn't care about me, but I heard about God blessing someone else. Naomi went back to Israel. She heard about God bringing food back into the land, and she went back. I heard about Ben. I heard about David Annie. I heard about Carson. And I thought, whatever is going on with him, I want some of that. Because even when the times get tough, he has a community He has a God, and he has a place where he can go and recover his hope, recover his joy, recover that full life that all these Christians talk about, but I don't see them living. Carson's got it. Dave has got it. Paris has got it. I want it. Hey, can I come to church with you this week? Hey, could you help me? What is it about you that's different? What is it about you that gives you that hope? The goal this month is to apply this redemption to our lives so that, John 10.10, the devil comes to steal. He'll do that all the time on Instagram and in your quiet moments. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Listen, listen, it's Connect Sunday. God's plan for you is community. God's plan for you is the community of Scripture, to live life with all of those people and their stories, but it's also to live in the context of a community of believers. The bride of Christ is the church. The church is the people gathered together for worship. We find salvation in the community of believers because when I'm down, Calvin's up. When I'm up, Matt's down. When Matt's down, Jackson's up. When Jackson's up, Corey's down. And we carry each other. A rising tide raises all boats. I'm going to have those days. Thank God I've got John Rogers. You know, I never call John. I've got his number. We never talk on the phone. But if I'm having a bad day and I go, you know who could really speak hope into my world? John Rogers. There's no question. There's no hesitation. There's no doubt in my mind that I could call him in a moment. He would drop everything. Not because I'm the pastor, but because he's a Christian. He knows what Jesus did for him, so he knows what he's called to do for other people. Got in trouble last year because I said, Chuck Dammer and I haven't had lunch in 25 years. Chuck was like, I'm so sorry we haven't had lunch. I was like, I didn't ask you, you didn't ask me, it's all good. And I'm gonna say it again. Chuck's gonna come to me after the service and go, man, we need to have lunch. It's fine, Chuck. Love lunch. The point is, 
If I ever needed anything, I know I can call Chuck. Chuck will drop everything. Well, Chuck's really special. He is, but that's not why. It's because he's a Christian. And I'm connected to him. He won't do anything for anybody. If he gets the number, it says unknown number. He picks up the phone. Could, could you have a minute? Could you come meet me? He's going to be like, ah, uh, this is weird. That's why we get connected now before we need it. We've got jumpy castles out there so your kids can get some fun on while you get connected. We've got food out there. Don't take it to go. Eat it here. We bought it so you'd stay. And you'd hear about what's going on in the church. Chuck's got a, da- a lanyard. Anybody with a lanyard, go see him. Get connected so you can get your life dead center in the middle of this story. Let's pray together. Let's ask God to bless us as we go for our week. Father, I thank you so much that you introduced us to this book of Ruth. God, thank you so much that you've helped us to see that our story is a part of the grander story of God's redemption of the world. God, I thank you so much that you've only just begun in every one of us to give us that full life that you promised. Holy Spirit, have your way in every heart that we might hear these words, go out from this place and be encouraged to be a light to everyone we meet. God, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.